Yeah, thanks a lot. And then we move immediately to the second paper on internal capital targets of banks that is presented by Cyril Coalier from the ECB. Thanks. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to present this paper. And before I start, let me remind you that uh, this is, of course, my views and does not necessarily reflect the views of the ECB. So in this paper and this presentation, I will talk to you about bank capital um, targets, bank capital ratios. So of course, this is an important question in general uh, for any type of firm, how they set their capital structure and how they move to reach their desired capital structure, but it's even more important for banks. Why is that? Because they are the main credit providers of our economies. So that's for a given quantity of capital, the ability to expand or shrink their balance sheet is of course extremely important for the funding of the real economy. And second, because regulators have imposed a set of capital regulations on requirements, sorry, on, on banks to avoid their costly default and to tackle moral hazard due to uh, deposit insurance. And so policymakers would like to know how this regulation affects uh, banks' behavior and how it makes them adjust their capital structure. In particular, since the great financial crisis, it has been clear that we need to make bank capital more counter-cyclical, so having banks increase their capital in good times when it's relatively cheap and use it in bad times uh, um, to absorb losses rather than restricting uh, credit. And it's important to know if banks consider those counter-cyclical tools, capital tools, to be indeed usable or if they just interpret them as additional strict capital requirements that they should never touch. The problem is that until recently, banks did not announce publicly their, um, their capital targets, so that researchers had to estimate implicit targets, which are, of course, noisy and makes it more difficult to, uh, to draw firm conclusions on, on those issues. And here comes uh, this paper. So in this paper, I, for this paper, I collected on banks' websites um, their targets that they announced to the investors publicly as part of their strategic planning along with other, other targets. And I use it, I use this new data set to revisit um, many questions that we could have on bank capital, on bank capital targets. First, how they set their targets. And here I find two important results. So first, banks do react to capital requirements. The higher the requirements, the higher the targets, which is obviously expected, but they do not react one for one. Meaning that when we increase requirements, they partially adjust their targets by reducing their target capital headroom over the requirements. It's not a one for one adjustment, it's lower than unity. And second important lesson, the impact of strict minimum requirements on usable buffers are not uh, different. They are, they are the same statistically, which means that banks do not seem to interpret the buffers, the regulatory buffers introduced after Basel III, to be more usable than, um, than the minimum requirements, contrary to the intention of Basel III reform. Next, I show that banks do take that target seriously. It's not that just something that they announce to the investors that they, they do not take, uh, care about uh, later. They do converge towards their targets over time, but the convergence rate is much higher when they are initially below their targets, which suggests that it's much more important for them to reach a certain level of solvency, because it's a primary concern uh, of the investors, rather than when they're above their targets, redistributing quickly their, their capital to, to the investors, probably because the investors know that the capital is, is there and could be distributed uh, later. Uh, and third, I, I explore how banks converge towards their targets, and I see that they adjust both through um, C2 and outstanding capital and through the assets. Two-thirds adjustment occurs through, um, through capital, so they increase their out outstanding amount of capital when they are below their targets, but one-third still occurs through assets, with in particular important impact on their corporate credit supply. And this I particularly explore in more details during the COVID crisis by using the credit justice data of, of the ECB. And I show that banks that, were, that had lower capital headroom or where they were below their targets, so had negative capital headroom if you want, compared their targets during COVID or the entrance of the outbreak of the crisis, expanded less credit than other firms, other banks to the same firms. So that they had lower credit supply because they wanted to preserve their, um, their capital or even better to, to increase their capital ratio to reach uh, their targets. So this is what uh, 
the targets I collected look like. On the right hand side, you have two examples, one from uh, BNP Paribas, the other from uh, Kexabank, where they basically both of them announced that they target um, situation capital ratio of 12%. Uh, for different um, point in times. And this is exactly how I collect this data set, going through uh, their quarterly or yearly financial reports, uh, strategic planning slide decks. And um, I have to say that um, more and more banks announce these targets. Before the great financial crisis was very rare. Basically, it's impossible to build this data set before. But since 2014, more and more banks have been uh, announcing uh, such, such targets as part of their uh, standard planning, because probably um, the regulatory environment is more stable, and also because after the great financial crisis, they have realized that capital is really important, so it's important to communicate on it. And so that's why that um, since 2018, my data set covers about 60% uh, of total assets in the euro area, starting from about 40% in 2014 at the beginning of, um, of, the, uh, of the sample. Importantly, banks announced targets in two different uh, types, either in levels, like we want to be at 15%, or as a capital headroom over our requirements, in particular over the, what is called the MDA trigger, so the amount of capital, the capital ratio three, below which they are constraining capital payout dividends, share buybacks, which already gives you a sense that, of course, targets are dependent on, on capital requirements. So before uh, I jump to econometrics, let me present you a few key stylized facts. The first one is the distribution of capital targets over time since 2014. And we, you see that after a period of a few years, three years of increase in those uh, targets, they are broadly, the distribution is broadly stable though, since 2017-18, and most targets are between 12.5 and 15%, which is related to the uh, stabilization of the regulatory framework capital requirements in, in Europe. But it doesn't mean that the targets at the bank level have been stable. This uh, overall aggregate distribution masks some heterogeneity uh, uh, over time at bank levels, so and that's sometimes targets increase, sometimes they, uh, they, they are reduced. Typically, banks move their targets uh, every two, three years. What's interesting also is that uh, the, great, the COVID crisis did not induce a massive change in those targets except a bit uh, on, on the tails, in the higher tail. What changed is actually more the distance to, um, between the actual capital ratio and their targets. So here, positive value means that banks are above their targets. When uh, it's negative, it means that they're below their targets. And we can see three clear periods. First, uh, in 2014 and in 2016, they were below their targets. They were trying to rebuild their, uh, their, their balance sheet after the great financial crisis, after the European sovereign debt crisis. And they did, and then, uh, as, as I meant, to, as the point of the target is, they stopped. So between 2016 and 2020, the distribution is well centered at zero, both in terms of yeah, the mean and the median are quite close to, to zero, which means that on aggregate, they were happy with where they were. And then COVID crisis uh, occurred, meaning that, as I said, the target did not move a lot, but the capital ratios increased, thanks to some uh, prudential uh, support, thanks to also uh, fiscal support that reduced the risk rates on um, um, some corporate credits, which uh, increased your, your capital ratio mechanically. So that now many banks, most banks, are above their capital uh, targets, and it's in line with now more announcement of higher capital distribution, because they have extra capital to distribute to, to their investors. Third stylized fact, here I plot the distribution of overall capital requirements in CT1 terms, by a budget of 20 uh, basis points against the target capital ratio. And see here you see two clear things. First, the relation is positive. So the higher the targets, the requirements, sorry, the higher the targets. Second, as I announced in the, at the beginning of this presentation, the relation is not one for one. Clearly, the slope is lower than, than one, meaning that when you increase requirements, banks tend to absorb past part of this increase by reducing their target capital headroom which suggests that they see a trade-off between the risk of breaching requirements and the, what they perceive as cost of running high capital ratios. Finally, here I plot the evolution of the distance to, to the target over time, depending on whether the, the bank initially was below or above the target. And you see two very different patterns. On 
both uh, on, on both sides, there is a convergence, meaning that the distance um, decreases over time, but it's massively faster when they are below their targets, meaning that they are really under pressure to reach uh, this target to be solvent and to reassure the investors. While when they are above their targets, apparently they have more time to redistribute the capital, the money is still here, at some point they will, they will give it back to investors or in, inflate the balance sheet. Now let's turn to the econometrics. Uh, I will be fast on this slide, but just to explain that uh, my work he, uh, contain four step, contains four steps. First, what are the determinants of the targets? Meaning that I regress the targets on a bunch of, uh, of bank level variables that include, of course, the overall capital requirements, uh, size, profitability, liquidity, business model, deposits, quality, and asset quality, and also on macroeconomic um, variables, in particular, uh, economic forecasts, um, so that because we can expect that how they see the economy to, to evolve in the next few years will affect what capital targets they, they, they want to reach, and also monetary policy and uh, sovereign rates. So I won't show you all those um, control variables for the sake of time, but I will comment on the main ones. Second step, I assess whether banks do take their targets seriously, so do they to converge towards their targets to the distance between actual and target capital ratio falls over time, Third step, how do they adjust towards their targets? So that here I will regress a bunch of balance sheet and uh, p &L, uh, variables on the, dis the distance between actual and target capital ratios, plus the control variables. And finally, as I said, I will do a deep dive into the COVID crisis at bank firm level, so not at, at bank level here, but regressing the credit growth uh, between uh, bank B and firm uh, F on this bank level uh, credit, um, uh, sorry, bank level uh, ca capital headroom, controlling for uh, the same variables on adding firm fixed effect to control for firm demand, credit demand. So before I start, let me also um, quickly present you what you probably already know, but let's, let's, it's still good to, to have a reminder about bank capital requirements. So after the great financial crisis, as I said, um, we wanted to make bank capital more counter-cyclical, meaning that we now have three blocks, main blocks in terms of, cap of capital requirements uh, in the euro area. The first one, which is called uh, TSCR, is um, also uh, known as minimum requirements that should be met at all times. And uh, yeah, it's extremely costly for banks to breach it. On top of, of them lie what are called the uh, combined buffer requirements that are meant to be met in good times, but to be used in bad times, so that banks should draw on those capital, on those capital buffers in bad times rather than uh, cut lending. And finally, on top of this uh, lies what is called the pillar to guidance, which is not a requirement per se, it's a capital demand, so that the bank should be able to fully use it, it's just that the supervisor would like them to, uh, to meet it in, in, uh, in normal times. But Breaching it, it's not a breach per se, but not meeting it is, uh, does not entail any automatic restriction of any kind. So that you could uh, expect that uh, those three layers of capital requirements have different impacts on targets. The more uh, stringent the capital requirements, the higher should be the coefficient because the higher would be the cost of breaching those, uh, those requirements. Okay, so let's turn to the results now. First, how do banks set their, their targets? And here I want to comment on two main types of, um, of, of, cap of variables. On the first uh, row, you have what I call the overall capital requirements plus uh, P2G, so the overall capital demands that banks face. And as you see, the coefficient is uh, strongly positive, both in poor regression and with firm fixed effects, but it's lower than unity, which confirms what we saw in the charts, and meaning that banks trade off the risk of an unintended breach of requirements with uh, the cost, what they see as a cost of holding high capital ratios. What's interesting is that when we break down those uh, capital demand into three, the three blocks, minimum requirements, usable buffers, and P2G, we do not have uh, the hierarchical effect that we would have expected. No? Minimum requirements and buffers have the same impact uh, on column three, and minimum requirements are not significant in column four, which, uh, so which include bank fixed effect, which is very unlikely because it's uh, strict, the structure forms of requirements, so it's probably due to the fact that with bank fixed effect, 
it's difficult to uh, estimate the impact of those, of those minimum requirements because they do not vary a lot. So everything is absorbed by the fixed effect. But still, you, mean, you see that there is no difference between the two, or if anything, the impact of the buffer is larger than minimum requirements. For the P2G, I do not identify any impact, but here, uh, I have to say that we should be cautious on this because, again, the P2G um, is, does not uh, showcase a lot of variation across banks, so that a lot could be absorbed by, uh, firm fi by, uh, by fixed effects or even pulled intercept. But overall, it suggests that, um, that banks do not distinguish between those different forms of, of requirements, at least not between buffers and memory requirements, which is uh, the opposite of what we'd like to, to see on what was the intention of Basel three. The second key variable I want to comment on here is the GDP growth forecast. You see that it has a negative impact, meaning that when GDP growth is expected to be higher, you see banks expect good times, then they reduce their target, capital, um, their target capital ratios, which means that it's typical of a kind of complacency that they can leverage more, it's typically what have seen, what a lot commented in the run-up to great financial crisis. On the contrary, during a crisis, when GDP growth forecast falls, then they tend to raise their, their targets so that to commit to being solvent and to navigate the crisis without failing. Second step, uh, I regress the, um, the distance between actual and target capital ratios on its own lag. I basically assess how it evolves, and you see here on the table that it falls over time. So coefficient is strictly below one, it's between zero and one, which means that this distance reduces over time. What's interesting is in column two, you see that the coefficients, that both coefficients when you start from positive or negative values are, again, below 0 and 1, but the coefficient is much lower when you're below uh, your target, which means that you adjust much faster to your target. Again, you're under higher pressure from your investors to reach your target. Third step of result, how you adjust. And here, so I regress all those variables that you see coming into the table on the, on the gap between uh, actual and target capital ratio, and you see that banks use a vast range of, um, of variables to adjust. Of course, the coefficient on the C2N ratio is negative, so that when you're above target, you tend to reduce your capital ratio to reach your target, and you do it by reducing your amount of capital through both issued capital and earnings, and by increasing your risk-weighted assets. In particular, you increase your loans to, um, to households and your loans to, uh, even more, your loans to corporates. And using those uh, figures, one can estimate what the contributions of capital and uh, RWA, and two thirds of the adjustment occurred through capital, but still one third occurred through risk weighted assets, which means that this distance to target has important impact on the credit supply policy of banks. And it's even more important when, again, when they are below their targets. As you can see, the positive impact of, uh, of the distance to target is statistically significant only for um, on capital, uh, sorry, on credit to loans and to households, to firms and to households, sorry, only for firms that started below their, their targets. And also the overall coefficient on the first column is larger if you're below your targets than if you're above it, which is consistent with previous results. Finally, deep dive on the, uh, yeah, let's jump that, uh, deep dive on the COVID crisis. So here, banks faced a huge credit demand shock due to uh, the lockdown, to high liquidity needs for firms. And uh, this uh, could have weighted a lot on their capital um, ratios because they would have to extend a lot of credit. So those that were below their targets were under higher pressure not to extend as much credit as the other banks to preserve their capital ratios. And so they did. You see again on the table on the right hand side that the target uh, the distance uh, to your target had a positive impact on your credit growth. So if you were uh, above your target, you, uh, you tended to extend more credit. And this effect is actually concentrated on banks that were below their target. So if you're above your target a lot or little, it doesn't matter. But if you're below your target, you really contract your credit or you extend it less to uh, preserve your capital ratio and to um, even reach your, your target. So overall, um, this paper introduces a cap uh, data set of um, announced capital uh, targets um, that European banks communicate to their investors, removing the need for estimation of those targets. It shows that targets are 
are largely uh, affected and determined by capital requirements, but not one for one. Banks reduce their capital headroom when capital requirements get higher, and banks do not distinguish between different types of capital requirements. Banks take their targets seriously, they adjust toward their targets, and in particular, it has a strong impact on credit supply, in particular during the COVID crisis. And this has important lessons for policymakers. First, because it shows that monitoring those targets has important, uh, draws important lessons for them, because knowing that a bank is above or below its target provides insight on how it will uh, uh, adjust its lending policy in the next few years. Second, it shows that banks do not seem to consider uh, regulatory buffers to be usable, which is a, uh, in stark contrast to the intention of Basel III. And third, it suggests that there is a need for counter-cyclical buffers, so it's not that buffers are usable, but you should reduce them in, uh, in crisis time because you should reduce your, uh, their targets, so that makes them having more capital headroom with a positive impact on credit supply during crisis. And this is it for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Cyril, and the discussion is Florian Haider from Goethe University, Frankfurt. Okay, hi everybody, and uh, thanks a lot for having me at the conference. Gives me an opportunity uh, to come back to a place that was uh, my home for nearly 20 years. So, um, but no disclaimer for me anymore. So, um, it's not so obvious because if in B Malatic you've tried to put in this little thing at the end of the bottom, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't fit the normal academic presentations very well. So, I'm, I'm, um, let me give you the one slide um, summary of the paper um, that uh, I was very happy to discuss because it brought me back uh, to some stuff that I was looking at more than 10 years ago. Um, but the headline is really that Cyril uses this new amazing hand collected data, which is he looked at what the banks tell you, regulators, markets, other banks, what they think is the target for their regulatory capital. So this is, uh, this is really a, a, an amazing novelty. And um, the paper then goes into arguing that, well, we could also get these uh, targets from observed data. You know, there's fluctuations. You try to get some trend or some average. But it's much better to, uh, to listen to what the banks tell you, right, than rather than figure out what they do. Um, and there's a couple of messages here. And let me just run quickly through them. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, yes, these targets exist, i.e. they're meaningful. It's not just that they announce anything. They seem to announce something that they take serious. They're bank-specific. Okay, fair enough. And they are procyclical, i.e. that when times are tough, they seem to tell you that they're going to aim for the higher targets, which then probably means that if these things are costly to achieve, they will have to cut down somewhere, and this would make things worse, and this ties nicely into this other procyclical things that we want to avoid but somehow cannot. Um, um, there's a very nice, obvious point, I think, well, it's nice, it's nice to see, is that if you're above the target, well, you know, life is good. If you're below, you feel the heat and you try to get out of there. Um, then how do you achieve that? You know, how do you close the gap? Because it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a numerator and a denominator and there's an asset side and a liability side. So which of those things are you gonna, you're going to play on? And the message is a little bit on everything. Um, you try to do something on the equity and you're trying to do something on the risks. On the equity, you know, this is not my biggest comment, but I was just wondering how they do that because they do not issue much new equity, um, particularly when they're in tough times. We have seen that this doesn't work usually. Um, so is it retained earnings because they seem to not cut dividends? So I would have loved a little bit more detail there. And then there is what they call the deep dive. They basically show in the, in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, Banks that had a large gap, and it's mostly the action below, so banks that were below what they had announced, COVID hits, they say, uh-oh, bad, um, and they cut lending. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a nice part at the end. So I really like that paper because it brought me back to something that I was looking at like many years ago, and I don't want to bore you with my old outdated research, but the idea was is that there was a time when people thought Banks are super boring because they're regulated. regulated. Regulation determines their capital structure. Bingo, no need for research. And that just was at that time just showing the histogram of the various. So this is Basel I, so not bank specific. You should have at least 4%. You see that distribution is truncated at 4%. Nobody was below 4%. And, but 
some were holding 25%. Uh, that seems not really in line with regulation determinants at all. And so this paper is in this tradition that we really, I think there's a really a need to understand at the bank level what they're doing. Um, so one of the, so we're going to my comments. Um, there's a lot of right-hand side variables. I was missing the most obvious one, which is risk. Uh, maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but um, we know that risk is, I mean, there are risk measures in there, but not the one that I would have liked to, which is measure of asset risk. It's a measure of unlevering the, the financial risk. Um, and we know that this is super, super important. Why? So this is a paper from Tobias Berg and Jasmine Gida. And they do something very, very simple. You just plot asset risk, so unlevered financial risk, um, against um, leverage. And you do that for corporates and you do that for banks and you really see that there's actually, there aren't really much outliers here. There's a nice negative relationship. If you have more risk, you hold less debt. Why do hold banks so much debt? Because at least on that measure, they're pretty safe. They're pretty boring. I mean, they're diversified. I mean, that doesn't quite square with financial crisis because you also see that there's always a couple of outliers and we may want to worry about because that spills over to those guys. But risk matters, that's my bottom line, and it's, 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 not, it's not in the paper. There's another thing that's not in the paper that I would have loved to see more about is it's all about regulatory capital, but there's also economic capital. So just take equity over assets or something like that. How does that interact? There are differences. I mean, when I had looked the last time at this thing, and you know, this is very outdated, 10 years ago, the correlation coefficient is like 0 0.6 between uh, equity over assets and, and something like tier one uh, capital ratio. So I think that would have been, it's a missed opportunity a little bit. I'm gonna be a bit harsh. I'm gonna dispense with most of the paper in one slide. I'm not a big fan of these um, capital structure adjustment, partial adjustment, whatever you wanna call these things, because first I think intellectually, it's very differ difficult to figure out, I have a target that's moving and that's why I see certain things happening. Or maybe the target is the same and just you're adjusting to the target according to economic conditions because the target is unobservable. So this paper here, of course, then goes, okay, this is observable because the banks tell you what it is, but that doesn't really do it the paper justice because I think it's then all about measurement error and there's so much in there that I wanna spend my remaining three, three or four minutes. And, and you know, for the econometricians, um, uh, you know, Blundell Bond is a painter estimate. So, um, um, so I, you know, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of that. Um, but I think there's a lot of stuff that Cyril can do in follow-up papers with the data. Because I would have really loved to know is why on earth do they tell you the things that they do, you know? What's the difference between the announcement? Why do they announce something different than the actual target? I mean, Cyril showed that there's a difference. Are there different drivers? Are they driven by the same factors? Um, are, there, are there permanent transi transitory differences? Like oh, very often you communicate the same thing and then every now and then there are special circumstances that the bank seems compelled to tell the world out there that this one should be an exit more or less. What's the timing? Should you change your forecast, your, 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 your targets? Um, are there revisions? Um, so, um, and what are you actually announcing with that ratio? Capital, are you announcing the denominator, the risk? Are you announcing both? Whom do you announce this to? Is it the regulator? You know, he's, he's already set some capital ratio for you. Is it other banks? Is it the markets? So I, I would have loved to know a lot more. I think there's a lot of cool stuff you could do. Why is that? Why, why do they do that? Because um, Cyril showed this graph here. So what do you see? So you're on the x-axis, you see um, um, the actual capital ratio. And on the y-axis, you see the... Um, the announced one. And you would imagine maybe, you know, as a benchmark, let's say they should all lie on the 45 degree line. You announce what's there. But they typically announce more, which so far so good. But I think the surprising thing is why is it the banks with the lowest capital ratio, so the ones on the left, lowest regulatory capital ratio, why on earth do they announce the biggest targets? You know, you would think that these are the, the ones that have the toughest time reaching those, if you think that always the low equity banks or the low capital ratio banks are, are sort of the bad ones. So I think this is the really interesting. I think there's a lot of stuff in there that you could uh, push further. I, I'm gonna finish with a little uh, deep dive on this COVID exercise, which I like a lot. There's a lot of work in there. So the regression is the usual quadra mian style. So you have the change in lending during COVID time. So pre-post, you look at the, comp you look at the, comp um, the, the firm's credit, 
Then you say there's a firm specific component, so that takes care of demand because you know COVID times, less demand. And then this uh, firm has borrowed from different banks and uh, they differ in their gaps. It's just that what here I've done is I've spelled out what the gap really is or how it's composed. And the gap in here was a bit unclear. So the gap, as far as I understood, is the difference between what you announce and what's the actual. It wasn't quite clear to me which time they were, were looking at because the actual, at least Cyril seemed to, at least what I could see in the paper, maybe I should have sent an email, but um, I, I didn't. Um, so the actual, the actual capital ratio is the one already with the COVID modifications, you know, with being able to draw down the, 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 the buffer and everything. And that to me was a little awkward because, you know, you'd normally want that, you know, the, a treated bank is one where the gap is large. But then suddenly now you're treated if you, re if you receive a lot of relief, right? You have announced 10%, your requirement was eight. The regulator says, don't worry, COVID, six, your gap goes up. Suddenly you lend less. Hmm, not sure what's going on there. So um, that, was, that was a question I had. But I think that's also something that you could really um, build on and make another separate paper out of that. I think it's a little bit, you know, underplayed. So my, comment, my summary, I think it's great data. I think it's, there's a lot of work. Um, I just think that these applications on the on the target capital structures and this dynamic stuff, it's very, very, very difficult to tease that out. And I don't think it does the data any justice. I think there's just so much more in there and I just would have loved to take a step back and really figure out why are they announcing and when they do. And, you know, from then, I think there will be a lot of insights about this, you know. Banks ex ex exist in a nexus between the regulator, the overall macroeconomic environment, and um, and investors. Yeah, thanks a lot, Florian. And now we have time for, for questions. Please be as concise as possible in the interest of time. So we go from left hand side and then. Yeah, Anatoly Segura from the Bank of Italy again. Very fast because it's very related with the, the main point of the of the discussion. So maybe something you should look at is which are the banks that do not signal their capital target and whether they are different and whether they behave differently. So that could shed some, some light on, on what, the, what banks are communicating when they decide to communicate. Thanks. So the question in the middle, yes. Um, hello, I'm Heather Gibson from the Bank of Greece. Um, I was wanting to ask a question because I think it's quite interesting. Um, if you look at um, the way in which banks meet their targets or meet the requirements, however we want to put it, do they, do they actually change the capital or do they change um, their risk-weighted assets? And I was wondering if, given that you've been looking you know, at, at banks' websites, uh, whether you've noticed that some banks do uh, manipulate, if you like, their assets, their risk-weighted assets, through synthetic securitizations. Um, and the question is, as supervisors, does it matter to us whether banks are effectively increasing their capital ratios by doing these uh, securitizations? Should they securitize the whole of the balance sheets in order to reduce uh, their risk-weighted assets? Um, so I was just wondering if, if, if you know, it's, it's perhaps um, a, a bit of an extension to what you've been doing. Okay, thank you. There was one question on the right hand side. I think Jakob. Thank you. So I'm going to say, having worked in a bank, uh, I think targets are taken seriously. You are communicating to investors what you're trying to achieve. Now you may fail, but I, I would still think that you're onto something here, right? Now, two points though. You keep being surprised by the fact that the bank's owners don't make a distinction between the, the buffers and the rest, right? I'm, I'm just going to say, I buy equity, I buy equity. I don't get to choose which part I own, right? So capital is just capital, and I want my money back, so to speak, right? So I'm a little bit, I wouldn't expect to find anything, so I'm glad you don't find anything, because you really shouldn't, right? <laughs> it shouldn't be there, right? So, so I guess... The, the other thing I had, and this is again the supervisory thing, you, you keep mentioning investors' uh, appetite f and, and, and impact on guiding bank management to doing this, that, and the other, right? I would have thought that you're, you're, you're finding that when you're below a target, you move quicker up and you're at least, you show an intent to do that. Well, if you're well above that you were less qu quick in bringing it down, 
I would have thought that the many supervisors in the room here would recognize that they might have a role here. That in fact the supervisors, not the regulator, but the supervisors may be the main obstacle. Because at least having sat on the other side, telling the supervisor that I'd like to lower capital because I got too much is not normally a well-received message, right? <laughs> it's like really, uh, we don't like it, you know. So I think, you know, before you write supervisors out of the equation, I, th I think they have a role to play here. Right? So I think that's maybe worth looking at, yeah? Thank you. Okay, then we look at the chat or the online participants more general. Andreas, do we have any? One question in the chat now. I, if I am allowed to indulge in a question to both author and discussant, says Costas Tsatsaronis, how do announced targets compare to those inferred by the econometrician, i.e. implied in behavior of banks? That's all? That's all. Okay, good. Then uh, I give back uh, to, um, to the presenter, Cyril. Yeah, no, thanks. I will also work uh, backward to, to answer the questions. So on the, on the last one, it's, so it's not something that I've uh, presented today for the sake of time, but actually it's, it's in the paper. I compare uh, estimated targets to the actual ones. And actually, um, the, um, uh, the distribution of the uh, estimation error is well centered on zero. So on average, uh, the econometricians do not make an error on average when they estimate the targets, but the distribution is very large. So that sometimes they are well below, sometimes well above what are the actual uh, capital uh, targets that, they, that uh, banks announce to their investors. Um, on the question, uh, the point of brother of the, su the supervisors that could drive the fact that it takes time to decline uh, for banks to, yeah, to, to distribute their capital, it's a very fair point. Indeed, I, I should include this uh, in, in the paper. It's probably, as you said, the main obstacle not banks' uh, own desire, uh, fair point. Uh, however, on the other point that capital is capital and uh, shareholders should not be interested in whether they hold the minimum requirements or the buffers or the P2G, it's true that it doesn't matter for them, they, they own capital, but the same overall capital requirement does not entail the same cost of breach if it's only composed of minimum requirements, that's, uh, the banks should never breach, or if, it's comp or if it has a layer of buffers that they could um, uh, draw on just at the cost of not being able to issue dividends for some time, or if there is an extra layer of P2G they can freely use. So you, sh you should still expect that they, they react differently in terms of capital targets um, to those different types of, of requirements, even if for a given shareholder, of course, his euro or her euro is not allocated to any of those uh, precise layers. Um, regarding the question of whether banks adjust with capital or RWA to reach their targets, um, maybe I was, I was fast on it, but um, it was, uh, I think it was in the presentation, so they, th they adjust two thirds of the distance, they, they close the gap by uh, two, th the, yeah, two thirds of the gap that they close is with a higher capital where capital are above their targets, and one-third is with RWA, or in particular with, um, with uh, loans to firms and to households. And um, so you raise the point of whether it works through uh, securitization that I didn't check, honestly. Um, but it would matter for the supervisors, that was your last point, because uh, if they reduce their uh, credit supply or if they keep the same but, uh, uh, but then securitize, it, of course, matter at least from a macro prudential perspective. Maybe not from the micro of the bank, but for the total environment, it matters a lot. And um, finally, an interesting point on uh, assessing which bank uh, not announce their targets and how do they um, behave compared to similar banks that do. Uh, it's a fair point. I haven't done it. I could. It's true that virtually all the large in the euro area announce targets, um, because most of them are, are listed, and when you're listed, you have to communicate to new investors at some point, typically quarterly, and they tend to announce, uh, to announce targets. Okay, so no one has heard anything of what I've said, or no, that's fine, okay. And so I don't have to repeat myself. Oh yeah, indeed, much better. Uh, yeah, so if you have heard it, uh, that would have been, my, that is my answer. So fair point, thanks for the suggestion, I will explore this, thanks. And uh, regarding uh, Florian's um, 
question uh, remarks. Um, then, so the point on asset risk, uh, right, having it as a control variable. So I have the risk rate density, so the ratio of uh, risk weighted asset over total assets. That's usually a measure of um, of asset uh, risk. Then I, indeed, it's a fair point. I could add add more, but as I was this one to uh, proxy this. Uh, on the impact of book capital, indeed, nice suggestion. I will uh, explore this. Uh, so why do they announce that their uh, target? It's the uh, same point, I think, that we uh, have same answer. I, I have to, to check that. And on the chart um, that, uh, okay, I do not have the presentation anymore, but the scatter plot, uh, I think there might be a, um, an, a misunderstanding because it's not the actual capital ratio versus the target. It's their requirements versus the targets. So that's those that were at, uh, at the left-hand side. Uh, they have the lowest requirements, not the lowest targets. So this may uh, clarify, um, because yeah, they just uh, they, they, they target a higher capital headroom, but still lower, uh, lower overall ratios than those that have higher requirements. Um, but then if it's unclear, maybe you can discuss uh, uh, later. And uh, for your question on COVID, so I took the capital uh, in 2019 Q4, so before the impact of, uh, of the of, uh, capital requirement releases, on uh, yeah, monetary support, fiscal support. Um, yeah, I could check with the business with other, um, other dates, but I think this one was really how they stand at the outbreak of the crisis, so it, it makes sense. Uh, 